Uh, so yeah, let me know if it's too loud or too soft. I'll try to hold it here. So yeah, right, uh, today I'm going to talk about futures from scratch for beginners by beginners. So I do kind of assume you have uh, intermediate Rust knowledge. We'll be going through some stuff a little quickly. Uh, I assume you don't know much about futures in Rust. I'll talk a little bit about async programming, though. Uh, so yeah, my name is Omar Navarro Leja. I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'll kind of mention how and why I need it to make my own future from scratch. So yeah, let's try talking about some of the motivation for futures. First, imagine you have a server and you want to listen to thousands of different connections from this server, which is very common. Uh, and when a message arrives, you're going to get that message and call some function, say, process message. So, and we want this to be in parallel, of course. So one idea is you could spawn thousands of threads, basically one thread per connection, but this is not going to work very well for many reasons. It just doesn't end up scaling. Uh, instead, this is one of the use cases for futures. So we're going to want to uh, run process message asynchronously using futures. And the idea behind a future, if you're not familiar, it's going to represent any computation or value that's not yet available, but sometime in the future we expect that value to come and be ready for us to use. So let's see a diagram of what uh, that kind of looks like. So in this diagram we see is a bunch of threads, and it's one, each one of these threads is running some futures. And notice, at any given time, one feature is going to run, and there's some part of the uh, runtime that's going to be responsible for multiplexing uh, this uh, features among multiple threads. So you end up having basically very lightweight, coroutine type things that run on a heavier weight OS thread. So let's talk about how it uh, ends up working for this specific diagram. So one feature is going to get to run on a thread until eventually that feature gets blocked, waiting for some I.O. event to come. And then it's going to yield execution, and it's going to allow some other feature to run on that thread. So some things to notice about this. Uh, this allows multiple features to run the same thread, which is great. We can really maximize uh, how we're using that specific thread. And futures are going to enable easy asynchronous programming in Rust, which is what's the, one of the main motivations for implementing futures. Because you could do this uh, through libraries, but having uh, language syntax really helps, and having some uh, language support really helps for this as well. So I like to think of futures as a style of cooperative multitasking with coroutines. So if you want to look more into some of these ideas, these are some of the words I would recommend at Google to learn about this uh, concept in programming. So, and this of course works very well for IO bound tasks that don't have as much computation to do, but they kind of sit around waiting for some IO event to come for a long time. So let's talk about how you actually end up running a future. And we're going to go over some terminology, because if you ever tried looking at how features work, there's a lot of uh, terms that kind of uh, get thrown at you. So the first one I'm going to talk about is what's known as an executor, which is basically also your runtime. And the idea is going to be responsible for running, scheduling, and pulling your tasks. And we'll see how all that works in a second. And for most cases, you don't actually end up rolling out your own or implementing your own things. You're going to use one that already exists. The most popular one, of course, is Tokyo. So if you're not familiar with Tokyo, that's the go-to runtime that people use for uh, futures. So one uh, part of the Tokyo project is this other uh, crate called Mayo. And the idea behind Mayo is going to be a very uh, lightweight but low-level wrapper around OS-specific I.O. events that you need to do. And in, futures ter uh, in the futures terminology, we're going to call this a reactor, which is uh, the part of the, if you imagine your futures as a stack, and you have your runtime, deep down, the part that actually talks to the OS is going to be your reactor. And that's, for example, what Mayo is, if you uh, are familiar with that or heard about it before. <laughs> so of course, most users now have to worry about these details, or even how it works. You just have to kind of uh, import them, and it does most of the work for you. Your goal is to implement some async functions, which we'll see in a second. So the question then is, why did I end up implementing my own future runtime? Uh, the current research project that I'm working on, the idea was we wanted to trace threads and processes. If you're familiar with how you do this in Linux, the idea is a system, a system call called ptrace. So if you use like GDB, this is how GDB traces your debugging uh, process or threads as they're running. The problem with ptrace, though, is that it's really old. Uh, from what I can tell historically, uh, ptrace has been around before threads even existed uh, in Linux. 
So uh, you can only ever p trace from a single process slash thread. You, uh, in a perfect world, I would have a single thread tracing some thread or some process. So you have a one-to-one -one correspondence. I can't really do that though. So core routines seem like the right abstraction for me. Uh, I like to. I wanted to logically write my code in a way that there's a core routine or a future running per thread or per process. But in reality, this all had to map to the same uh, thread of execution. So some other things, uh, I first tried to pick up Tokyo or Mayo, and I wasn't exactly sure how to use it. Most of the examples revolve around network I.O. Uh, even right now, I'm not sure if I could or could use it for my purpose. I'm sure there's a way to get it all working. But uh, I ended up going down the rabbit hole. And uh, this is how I implemented a single threaded future runtime from scratch. So to kind of show the difference, uh, this is what a, we, we just went over this. And my understanding of a multi-threaded uh, runtime looks something like this. You have your executor, which runs on a thread, which may or may not share that thread with features. And similarly, a lot of the examples for uh, simplicity uh, spawn the reactor in its own thread, and you let that just run and send events over to the executor to let it know when IO events arrive. Uh, it wasn't obvious to me how to get this working single-threadedly, though. So this is a very high-level picture of what I wanted to do. All my futures, my reactor, my executor, and everyone else is sharing the same thread of execution. So uh, what we're going to do, I'm going to show you how this is implemented. And I, it was really hard. I spent a week digging down documentation. Uh, I believe the situation is better now. This was, uh, say, half a year ago, where features were still in flux. So a lot of the blocks and documentation were still uh, either outdated or were changing so quickly that people hadn't really written a lot of documentation down for it. Uh, they're pretty, uh, futures have been pretty much stabilized and they'll be released soon as part of a uh, stable. So I'm gonna kind of show uh, what I learned and how you can implement your own future from scratch if that's what you want. Uh, one note though, types have been simplified to uh, protect the innocent because uh, there's a lot of details that uh, don't really aid in the main idea. So if you're familiar with features and I show some function prototypes and you're like, that's not the real type, it's, uh, you know, it's conceptual, but it, it's close enough where I argue it's almost what you want. So our idea for us, we're going to implement a wait process event uh, future, and the idea is that we will asynchronously wait for our process to finish. So what we're gonna wanna write is a function called wait for child, and we're going to spawn our wait process event with some process identifier, PID. And now, what we're going to want to say is asynchronously, this is what an async block looks like if you haven't seen one before. We're going to say child process, which is our wait process event, and we're going to set dot in wait. And that's going to wait for a status to come, and we're going to return that status. So let's look at what the return type of this function looks like. It's some type that implements a future where the output is our wait status. So wait status is the name of uh, the status we get once a process is done running. And let's notice a few things. So there's this keyword dot await. That's something that's just been added to Rust. And the idea, this is the yield point I was talking about earlier. So we're going to here wait for an IO event to arrive. And this uh, function or computation is going to be paused. All its state is going to be saved and we're going to actually run another feature uh, in the meantime. Eventually, our event will come around and we'll return and start running our code exactly from here. So if you're familiar with like generators in Python, it's a similar idea of being able to pause a function and later returning to where we were. So one other thing, to use dot await, you may only use it inside an asynchronous block. Uh, one cool thing is about is async, the keyword, it can also be used at the function level. So let's see how that differs. This is the exact same function written with async. So a few things to notice. Now the entire uh, body of this function is an async block, so we no longer have to have that. And similarly, the return type of this function has changed. So it's no longer a implement future output equals wait status, it's just wait status now. So anytime you see an async function with a wait status, you have to remember implicitly that's returning a future, not the actual type we see listed there explicitly. But that's what async does when you write it at the function level. So let's start from the very beginning. Uh, what is a future? I talked about it conceptually, but what does it look like uh, in code? And it's very simple, it's just a trait. So this is what the future trait is implemented like, or uh, what it looks like. 
and it is an output type. And the idea of the output type, this will be the value that would eventually be yielded or be returned once the computation, once the I.O. or some other computation comes. For us, this is a uh, output will equal weight status. So that's an associated type, if you haven't seen those before in Rust. And the idea is that we're going to have our executor or runtime that's going to pull this future until the I.O. event arrives later. So I haven't really talked about this return type of this function. Notice when we poll, we take ourselves and a waker, we'll get back to the waker, and we return a poll. A poll is a very simply defined enum. It's either going to be ready with the value t, where t is the output type, or it's going to be pending, saying that I polled, but this computation hasn't actually arrived yet. So uh, we'll, we'll, you can come back to that later. So uh, let's see what it means to implement a uh, future. So here we have a struct called wait process event. Another struct is going to hold this a process identifier. That's all it needs to know. And now we're going to implement a future for the straight, doing implement future for wait process event. Of course, as I said earlier, our output is going to be wait status. And similarly, look, our poll returns a wait status. So what we're going to do, we're going to match in the result of wait PID. That's a Linux system call that says wait for a specific process, and we're going to pass it our PID. And then we have one extra argument to this function called uh, with no hang, is uh, how you pronounce that. And the idea is wait PID by default is blocking, like most IOs. Uh, you have to make a, pass a special flag to make it polling. And this is something really important about futures. You never want to block, the, uh, because if you do that, the entire thread gets blocked. So other futures can run. You're blocking every other feature that wants to run that thread. Instead, you always want to do poll in I.O. So there's two possibilities that return from wait status. One is uh, still alive. That means that the process is still running and uh, nothing has changed in the status. Otherwise, we uh, match it with W, meaning this is the wait status. So let's see what happens in each case. So as I said earlier, there's some code here that I'll come back to later, which is where we use that waker that we're taking as a parameter. So for now, what we're going to do is return, return pending because uh, nothing has changed. Otherwise, in success, we merely call poll ready with our value, and we return that out. So let's get a high level idea of how our entire system is going to kind of work and look. And uh, we'll be referring back to this diagram and back to the code. So hopefully we'll be able to make a uh, isomorphism between the two. So we start with a task. And a task is a, the instantiation of a future. So when a feature is running, we refer to it as a task. So our task is going to have a few things inside. It's going to have a future. It's going to have some identifier. For us, this identifier is the PID. And it's going to have that waker we uh, saw earlier. And then, of course, the other big component is the executor. And we're going to want to add tasks to our executor. And we're going to do that through this add future function that we will implement soon. So now this executor has this task represented as this little box T. And now we're going to ask the task to make a waker for us. So tasks know how to make wakers. Uh, so the waker will be represented by this little box uh, with a W in it. And then, as we said, uh, task will also hold the future. So we can just get uh, the future field out to get a future. So now uh, I'll get back to the two colors in a little bit, actually. They'll become more obvious soon. So now futures have a poll method that's inherited from traits. We're going to call poll by passing it the future and the waker. And now this is going to do some polling I.O. That's the wait PID function we saw earlier. And as I said, there's two possibilities. If the value is ready, that gets returned up to the executor and then back up to the uh, future that was running. Otherwise, let's see what happens when the uh, future is polling. So when it's polling, we need to add some more information now. Executor holds waiting tasks. These are all the tasks that are waiting to be run but haven't actually been polled or we don't know if they're ready to run yet or not. So we're going, since we saw that specific task was pending still, we're going to move it from uh, an executor and add it to our waiting tasks. And now the reactor comes into play, which I talked about briefly. And what we're going to do, since we're pending, we're going to register our waker with the reactor. And all we're going to do is pass this little W box to the reactor. And the reactor holds a bunch of wakers. Remember that a uh, 
a waiter corresponds to a specific task. And the idea is, next what's gonna happen, the executor is going to say, okay, well, that task didn't work, it's still pending. So it's gonna ask the reactor, please uh, wait for an event to arrive from some IO. So the reactor is going to do some block in IO here. This is the only place where we do block in IO. And this happens because the executor knows there's no uh, old tasks are waiting. There's nothing to be done right now. So you could sit there and uh, hold each task by looping through them, but that's just like no better than busy waiting and we're burning CPU time. So instead we let the reactor block until some event comes from any task. So eventually an event will come in the form of an ID. This is our PID. And we're going to use that to index into our wakers. And what's going to happen is the reactor is going to call the dot wait method on a waker. A waker has a dot wait method. And the idea behind the wait method, it knows how to tell the, exec the executor which task is ready to run next. So what's going to happen, dot wait is going to reach into our waiting tasks. And there's this little next task field. And it's going to move the task from the waiting task into that to the next task field. So now the executor, which knows which task to run next, it'll pull and the cycle will continue, and this whole thing will keep uh, cycling until they, uh, we're out of task to run. So that was uh, kind of uh, a lot. So we'll we see how this parts uh, look in the code, and we'll be referring to this diagram again to see how it all works. So you might be curious why this diagram is so complicated. So now notice that we have two colors. We have orange and we have gray. Uh, this has to do with the coupling. It tells you which components need to know about each other. So the executor needs to know about the task and the, why it's fairly intuitive is because the executor needs to know how to run a specific uh, So the executor defines uh, the task that it wants to take in and what they look like. And notice the wakers are also orange. And that's the most obvious one. That's because the waker needs to be able to reach into the executor and move a task from waiting task to next tasks. But now notice that the executor doesn't really have to know about the gray components. These are the reactor and the future. So the idea behind this is you want to be able to mix and match your uh, reactor with your executor or your runtime with the thing that's doing the low-level I.O. So uh, the future and the reactor are doing the same kind of I.O. So they need to be able to understand the I.O. that the uh, specific feature is waiting for. But in general, the reactor doesn't really need to know anything about the executor as long as they agree on an interface. And we'll see how that works soon. So as I mentioned, a task represents a wait, uh, running feature. And as we saw in the diagram, all that task is going to hold is a PID and a future. And a task knows how to make wakers. So a waker is going to be an opaque handle as far as the uh, reactor is concerned, and all it's going to have is a dot wake method. And a task is going to create a waker, so there's always going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between tasks and wakers. And when you do waker.wake, it's going to inform the executor that which task is ready to be pulled again. So let's see what that looks like. Our wake method is just going to reach into waiting tasks and it's going to remove the correct task based on a PIE, and it's going to move it into uh, this nest task field, which we'll see where that lives in a second. All right, that maps to this idea of uh, being able to move a, something from waiting task to next task, and simplify, that's just two lines of code to reach into this uh, map and move the task over. So let's talk about what the executor looks like now. So notice that our executor is going to be parameterized by some generic R, where R implements reactor. And this is what I meant that uh, we're gonna be able to take any reactor in, as long as we agree on a simple interface called reactor, which we'll be seeing in a second. And a reactor is going to hold a mesh hash map from PIDs to task, that's going to be our waiting tasks. And it's going to hold a single task as an option called next task. And that maps to uh, our waiting task right there, our next task. So it's just two simple fields, a hash map and a option. And of course, the, way, uh, the reactor has a uh, handle to, sorry, the executor has a handle to the reactor, so you can call it. So let's see how this add future method is implemented. We're just going to take a task. 
And what we're going to do, we're going to make a waker by telling the task to make a waker. And next, we're going to take our future, which is a field in task, and we're going to pull. And again, that's going to return pending or ready. On the pending case, it means that uh, this task, the I.O., we're still waiting for it. So all we're going to do, we're going to add that specific task into our waiting tasks. Otherwise, if we return ready, this feature is done. So we're just not going to even bother adding it to our waiting tasks. So that's if we add a future for the first time, we're going to pull it once just to see what happens. Now let's talk about, you have added a bunch of futures, and most of them are waiting, and you want to just run them all to completion. So this is where we're going to implement this run all method, which as you see is just going to be a loop that runs till it's done, and we'll see how. So at this point, your executor knows that uh, all futures are waiting, so it's going to call their reactor and tell their reactor, please wait for an event to come. This maps to uh, this wait event up here. And now, as I said earlier, I can show you the diagram really quickly. When we wait for an event, we're going to block, and when an event comes, uh, we're, the reactor will call that wake. And that wake is going to move a waiting task into our next task. So by convention, the, after we return from that line of code right there, we know that we can take the value from next task, and that'll be the correct task for our executor to run. And what we're going to do again is pull this task. So what if you pull it and it says pending? That means that that specific task did make some progress, but later down there was another await for some I.O., so it is again blocked. So we're just gonna put it back in our waiting tasks. Otherwise, if it's ready, we check whether this is the last task in our hash map by checking if it's empty. And if it is, we uh, set all done to true, and we're done running our features. Otherwise, this loop will keep on going, and this is how we keep making progress uh, running our features. So we saw this earlier already. This is just our implementation for poll for our wait process event. And I said, uh, we'll get back to what happens here with the waker. Based on this diagram, we know what should happen when we see pending. We should register our waker with the reactor. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to go call the reactor and go into its wakers. And we're just going to insert our PID and pass it our waker that we were given. So this is, again, the idea that the two components are decoupled. Even though the waker is orange in our diagram, and our uh, future is gray. Notice that this poll function does nothing with the waker except pass it along. So it doesn't need to know anything about its implementation or what method it even has. So now the last component we need to talk about is our reactor. And as I said earlier, the reactor defines, so, sorry, so the executor needs to define some interface to know how to speak to the reactor. This is going to be a simple trait which is a single method, wait for event. And the idea is that we're going to make this a trait to allow different uh, reactors to work with our executor. So all our reactor is going to be is a uh, hash map of PIDs to wakers, called wakers, which is exactly what we see here that our reactor holds, just a uh, list of wakers. So let's now implement this reactor method uh, for our specific reactor. Uh, by implementing wait for event. And the idea is that, as I said earlier, we're going to do some actual blocking I.O. here. So we're going to call wait ID, which is very similar to wait PID, but a little more general. And we're going to tell it, please wait for any, uh, for any event to come from a PID. And that's going to return some PID. And now we need to inform the executor that this specific task is ready to run. So all we're going to do is switch into our wakers and use that PID as an index and called dot wake. So similarly, notice that the reactor doesn't really need to know anything about the wakers, except that it has a dot wake method that we can call. And the dot wake method is what knows how to tell the executor which task to run next. So hopefully now uh, this diagram makes a little more sense of how uh, things move around. So some closing observations I want to make about futures. They're very general. Even though I have talked everything in the uh, context of I.O. and waiting for I.O., you can actually wait for other types of computation. 
So one like, simple example people use a lot is a timer and waiting for a timer to finish. But you could basically have your uh, future be any computation that you eventually want to wait for it to be done, not necessarily just I.O. Similarly, this idea of being able to decouple the reactor and executor uh, is why the types and the uh, traits look so general. But it allows us to mix and match reactors and executors, which I think is a really powerful thing that uh, Rust allows you to do. So uh, I really appreciate and admire all the like design that went into making these components work the way they do, and how general the types need to be to allow for many designs. For example, you can implement a fully multi-threaded runtime and executor, or you can implement a single-threaded one using the same uh, interfaces, which I think is really cool. So that, yes, that was my talk. Thank you.